Oh, would you look at that? It's time for another two years of death threats. Hello, welcome back to Simon's Rants. I'm Simon, and today I'm going to be talking about why Stan Lee, the documentary, sucks. Now, yes, I'm aware a few years ago I made a video titled Why Stan Lee Sucks, and it was quite the video. Uh, at first it didn't get a whole lot of views and then Stanley died and for the next two years after that I was given death threats, told to kill myself and many other terrible things for about two years. I had to turn comments off on that video and was still getting those same death threats on other videos because they would leave that video and go there. So I am not going to turn off comments this time. I'm also not going to turn off likes and dislikes. I'm just gonna say this. If you are pathetic enough to tell me to kill myself over some person you've never met just because he supposedly made some comic books you really liked, you're a loser and that stands for itself. So if you wanna comment that, <laughs> go right ahead, buddy. If you are so obsessed with the man of Stan Lee that if I say anything negative about him that I will seriously offend you and you will feel so strongly that you want me to die, one, seek help, two, don't watch this video because I'm going to be giving you evidence, I'm going to be giving you descriptions from people that actually knew him and worked with him. This is going to be a much more in-depth video than the first time because I did about a 10 page paper on this. It's got a lot more research, this should be a lot better video. Frankly, that other video sucks. I don't like it. I had to re-watch it because I was trying to get some links from the first time I did this video. That was cringy. Hated that video. But this video should be hopefully a lot better uh, even if my Spider-Man t-shirt doesn't fit it quite as well as it used to, but uh, yeah, this should be very informative, very educational for a lot of people, so if you want to be informed, stick around, if not, go kill yourself or something. Okay, thanks, on with the video. So I do want to get into why Stan Lee, the documentary itself, sucks, but first I think I need to explain why Stan Lee, the man, sucked. I think the best place to start with Stan Lee is that he likes to call himself the co-creator, or sometimes, depending on when you catch him, the sole creator of Spider-Man. In fact, the only reason he doesn't call himself the sole creator of Spider-Man is because there was some legal trouble with Steve Ditko, the other creator of Spider-Man. Steve definitely felt that he was the co-creator of Spider-Man, and that was really after he said it, and I saw it meant a lot to him, that was fine with me. But do you yourself believe that he co-created it? I'm willing to say so. I want to read for you the account according to Wikipedia. This is the actual Wikipedia account of how Spider-Man was created. This is not an opinion. This is how it is actually written on Wikipedia. It says, Stanley thought up the name I did costume, web gimmick on wrist, and spider signal. Essentially, Stan Lee came up with the basic concept of a superhero called Spider-Man, but Steve Ditko came up with the rest. He came up with how he looked, he came up with his superpowers, he came up with the design, as well as a spider signal. If you see in the various early designs of Spider-Man, he had a web gun. This was later changed to web shooters on his wrists. So you can understand that the character went through a lot of changes. These changes were created and designed by Steve Ditko, the artist and storyteller behind Spider-Man. Despite this being the account of how Spider-Man was created, like I said, Stanley still liked to try to claim complete ownership over the creation of the character. He had complained to me a number of times when uh, there were articles written about Spider-Man which uh, called me the creator of Spider-Man. And I had always thought I was. Which brings me to the second part of this video, that Stan Lee himself didn't actually really create any of his characters. This account that I just laid out of how Spider-Man was created was the norm for how Marvel created most of their characters. It's actually even called the Marvel method. Stan Lee would come up with the basics for a character, usually the name of the character, maybe some superpowers, and the basic outline of a story. He would then give that to the artist, who would then create the look and feel and design of the character, and then flesh out the stories by making the drawings and penciling in suggestions for for words. From there, Stanley, if you wanted to change anything to the dialogue, could. But if you believe Alan Moore, he didn't. Having seen Jack Kirby's pencils, um, 
you know, you've got the whole thing broken down. Uh, and Jack Kirby would have done all that. And then you've got Jack Kirby's dialogue suggestions for every panel penciled in the margins. And you start to realise that what Stanley has done is taken, yeah, Stanley, Jack Kirby's dialogue, some of it was a bit clunky. What Stanley had largely done was to fancy up Jack Kirby's dialogue, put in a few these and thous and forsooth, <laughs> true believer. You know. Um, but essentially, it was Jack Kirby who wrote and drew those comics. Um, essentially, it was him who created all of those characters. By his own admission in the documentary, he had no idea what was going on at any point in time. Jack and I have gotten to work so well together that uh, our plotting session will be something like, hey, in the next Fantastic Four, Jack, let's let the villain be Dr. Doom. Okay, where does he come from? Where did we leave off with him? And I'll say, oh yeah, he was fading off into another universe. Find some way to bring him back, Jack, and then we'll have him attack the Fantastic Four. Jack will say fine, and he goes off. And by the time he brings the artwork back, it might be that particular plot, or he might have changed 50 million things. Does that sound like a writer? No, that sounds like a publisher or producer. A guy that just sits back and goes, ah, we should do this. You come up with a way to do it. That's a manager, not the actual artist. Stan Lee goes back and forth, depending on when you'd listen to him, talking about how much he actually changed and how much he had to do with the plot. But in the documentary, you do have audio of him admitting that Ditko came up with the plot. Steve is a very creative guy. Well, I get a story back from him and I don't have the vaguest idea what this is about because I didn't even give him a thumbnail idea. He just went home and he did whatever he wanted. But it's not just Alan Moore and Steve Ditko who had things to say about Stan Lee. It was all of his artists, Jack Kirby most notably. In a 1989 interview, Kirby, best known for the Fantastic Four, Thor and his many contributions to the comic book medium, I'll add Captain America as well, bluntly and categorically stated, Stan Lee and I never collaborated on anything. It wasn't possible for a man like Stan Lee to come up with new things or old things for that matter. Stan Lee wasn't a guy that read or that told stories. So that is somebody who worked firsthand with Stan Lee on many, many comic books throughout Marvel's history. Kirby's son, Neil, told The Observer, if you were to look at the list and timeline of Marvel's characters from 1960 through 1966, the period in which the vast majority of Marvel's main characters were created, you will see Lee's name as a co-creator on every character with the exception of the Silver Surfer, solely created by my father, Jack Kirby. Are we to assume that Lee had a hand in creating every Marvel character? Are we to assume that it was never the other co-creator that walked into Lee's office and said, Stan, I have a great idea for a character? Now, this may sound like some rantings of some disgruntled workers, a couple of artists that were frustrated by their boss and didn't like working for him. But it wasn't just Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko. It was, like I said, Alan Moore and also Gil Kane, other artists that worked around them and gave them the credit. Jack was the single most influential figure in the turnaround in Marvel's fortunes from the time he rejoined the company. It wasn't merely that Jack conceived most of the characters that are being done, but... Jack's point of view and philosophy of drawing became the governing philosophy of the entire publishing company and beyond the publishing company of the entire field. Marvel took Jack and used him as a primer. They would get artists and they taught them the ABCs which amounted to learning Jack Kirby. Jack was like the holy scripture and they simply had to follow him without deviation. That's what was told to me. This is a guy who worked for Marvel and he is saying first account what happened to him. By Stanley's own admission in the documentary, he says, we were up until that point just doing what everybody else was doing. We were just publishing what everybody else did. If Western books were good, we published a thousand Westerns. If romance books were in, we published a million romance books and so forth. We just followed the trends. It was when Jack Kirby came back on board after leaving Timely Comics, which then later became Marvel Comics, things began to work better and comics began to sell and really blow off the roof. Now you may be thinking, okay, so these guys did create some of the characters, but Stan Lee was still a creative force behind that. Okay, maybe, but Stan Lee had complete creative control from 1941 through 1958 without any notable works being introduced. It wasn't until Kirby returned in 1958 that anything of note was created again. Coincidence? 
or obvious correlation. You could say that maybe this had to do with Stan Lee not having yet hit his stride. After this point, he then began creating a lot of things. I mean, Spider-Man, X-Men, Fantastic Four, all of those things. Again, maybe, but then why, when Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko left, was nothing important made again by Stan Lee? Steve Ditko left in 1966 and Kirby in 1970. Between 1966 and 1972, when Stan Lee stopped writing, the only notable characters created by Stan Lee were the Silver Surfer, which earlier was solely credited to Jack Kirby, but now is co-created by Jack Kirby and Stan Lee. The Abomination, which was co-created by Gil Kane, Black Panther, which was co-created by Jack Kirby, Modoc, which was co-created by Kirby, and Captain Marvel and the Falcon, who were co-created by Gene Colan. After Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko left, Stan Lee didn't create anything. So is this, like I said, coincidence? Or is this an obvious correlation between who was really making these characters and who was just putting his name on them because he was a publisher and editor? Technically, he was helping write these stories because he might go in and change a word or two, or he might have some say on how the plot went, but he wasn't writing it. But because technically he had some influence on it, he could say that he was the creator. He could say that he was the co-writer and co-creator and publisher of these stories, and so he did for every character that Marvel created while he was the head writer. Do you think he really was creating all those characters or do you think that he was just taking advantage of the system? Now, I understand it's quite a serious claim to say that Stan Lee was lying about all these things. He said he made them, so why shouldn't we believe him? Well, because he's been caught lying about a lot of things. Don't believe me? Here is a list of the things he lied about. When the original Captain America film was being ready to be made, it was credited as Stan Lee's character, Captain America. Captain America was created when Stan Lee was only 12 years old. He had nothing to do with that character at all. All. The Human Torch is thought of as one of Stan Lee's precious Fantastic Four creations, but he was first seen and popularized in 1939. He was one of Marvel's, at the time, Timely Comics, most popular characters throughout the 40s. He was only just reintroduced and adapted by Stan Lee years later to better suit his Fantastic Four storyline, despite Stan Lee's claims that he created the characters. I came up with four superheroes. I called the Fantastic Four. Stan Lee also claimed we started saying, hey, wouldn't it be fun if we, you know, had a green skinned monster and we call him the Hulk? Wow. When the original Hulk was gray, it was only through misprinting and running out of ink that the Hulk became green. So they created a character that was gray that then ended up accidentally in several issues being green. That became the more popular version and that's what they went with. It wasn't a creative decision, let alone a creative decision by Stan Lee. Stan Lee also loves to claim credit for creating Thor, which was a Norse god. Yes, he decided to turn him into a superhero. Whether or not that was his actual decision, I don't know, but somebody at Marvel did, and sure, they made that decision, but that would be like writing a book about Zeus or Jesus Christ and claiming to have created the character. That is a complete joke. He didn't actually come up with his famous phrase, with great power comes great responsibility. Let me read you a quote by Winston Churchill in 1906. Where there is great power, there is great responsibility. Where there is less power, there is less responsibility. And where there is no power, there can, I think, be no responsibility. So Stan Lee didn't even come up with that quote. He plagiarized it from Winston Churchill. He also loves to claim that his wife inspired Gwen Stacy, a character that was created by Steve Ditko, by the way, and was the woman he'd been drawing his whole life, which is a double lie because one, he doesn't draw. This is an example of Stan Lee's artistic ability. He's never claimed, even on Wikipedia when it talks about his job description, he's never credited as an artist. So what does he mean that she's the woman he's been drawing his whole life? He was never an artist. He never aspired by his own admission to be a comic book writer. That wasn't something he was interested in. He just fell into it. So why would he say something as strange as the woman that he's been drawing his whole life? That is a weird thing to say. I always felt I was really wasted time. I'm writing these stupid little fantasy stories. I always felt, you know, how could a grown man be doing comic books? He just felt that he can't 
just go on doing this what he thought was childish stuff. And not only that, but he also claims that Mary Jane was actually the one that he designed his wife after in the documentary. So which is it? Or is he just making up shit as he goes? Mary Jane for example, it was very peppy and effervescent and kind of hip and cool. That was my wife. Stanley even goes as far as to say that he helped come up with the name for Marvel Comics, which is just hilarious. It's such a funny moment in the documentary when he says that. I began to realize we have a whole new audience. At that time, we were calling the company Atlas. So we got to get a new name. These aren't the same things we were doing before. And Martin and I came up with the name Marvel. So I went ahead and looked it up and this is the account of what really happened. Goodman chose to name Marvel Comics after the first comic they published back in 1939, Marvel Comics number one. And by the way, Stan Lee was 16 at the time that comic was put out, so I don't think he had anything to do with that name. And what's even funnier is that in the documentary, he actually claims to have created Marvel. You are the guy that really created Marvel Comics, aren't you? Yeah, well, after a while, when you become a living legend, they get to know your name. Uh, I, I created Marvel Comics with the help of the various artists involved also, of course. And maybe what he means by that is that he is the reason Marvel was of note, but his exact words are that he created Marvel. That's... <laughs> It's just not true. How does he keep lying and getting away with it? This is in the documentary, dude. If you don't believe me, if you don't think my opinions matter, if you think I'm making stuff up, or like I said, you think these artists are just disgruntled, once again, I point you to the fact that Alan Moore and Gil Kane and all these other people that agreed with Steve Ditko and Jack Kirby, their art, their, their creations weren't necessarily stolen, but they still saw it happen and had to speak out. Alan Moore went on a full rant against Stan Lee. Why do you think he would do that? He didn't have any real skin in the game. He was just somebody who loved Stan Lee as a kid, looked up to him, met him, and went, holy shit, this guy sucks. I, I really don't have a great deal of respect for Stan Lee. I had huge respect for him when I was a kid. I thought that he was possibly the best writer in the English language that had ever been. Uh, but as I said earlier, when you start in the industry, you find out that Jack wasn't jolly, and you find out why. And you find out that Steve wasn't sturdy, and you find out why. And you find out why Stan was smiling. <laughs> you know? Um, I don't think of him as a particularly gifted writer. I'm not trying to slack somebody who's an old man. But. Um, <laughs> and it is a big but. You know? All these people, they had their work stop on from. Um, I don't want to end this on a particularly bitter note, but sort of, you did ask, so, no, not a huge fan of Stan Lee, um, huge fan of a lot of the people that he worked with. And also, if you don't agree with me that this documentary is lying and that Stan Lee was lying, then answer me, why did Disney have to settle? Jack Kirby's son sued him on his behalf and Disney Plus had to do a settlement where they paid an undisclosed amount, but it's between 30 million and 60 million dollars to Jack Kirby's estate, as well as giving him credit in all future projects. So if you don't think that they're lying, then why are they keeping all this hush hush and paying people money under the table? They know that there's evidence against them. They're just doing it because it's the popular thing to do and because you crazy ravenous MCU and Marvel and Stanley fanboys out there who are wishing death upon people who say anything bad about their favorite thing to fanboy over will eat it up. It's, it's ridiculous. So that is a good reason to doubt the morality and character of Stan Lee. The fact that there is a lot of evidence of him lying but it goes just beyond that there's evidence to show that he is used to taking whatever he wants with no repercussions beyond the comic book world because he was also sued by his nursing home attendants for groping and sexually assaulting the nurses what a hero a true american hero <laughs> God. He also, by his own admission in the documentary, says that he did it for money. He was constantly in money problems because his spending habits were ridiculous. He was constantly in debt, and so he had to create these comics because it was his only way of making money. Whatever Joni wanted, I'd say, that's fine, honey, I'll write another story tonight to pay for it. 
not only her, anytime I wanted something. I want a new car. Okay, I'll write a couple of stories that'll take care of the down payment, and I'll keep writing stories every time the payments come due. He was creating out of necessity, not out of passion. He, by his own admission, said that he thought comic books were a waste of time and childish until all of a sudden he started getting a lot of money for it. And all of a sudden now, oh, you know, maybe this isn't such a waste of time. That really sounds like somebody who's passionate about what they're doing and definitely just doesn't care about the money. Absolutely. I will also just say that it's very clear that his ego was massive. I'm embarrassed to say this, but I think I'm my biggest fan, he says charmingly with absolutely no shame. I'll look through some of the old issues and say, gee, this is wonderful. Did I really write this? And one, that sounds like an admission of guilt. Like he doesn't remember these stories because he didn't actually come up with them. And two, he has the biggest ego ever. He is his own biggest fan. He's a celebrity to himself. It's just, he's he sucks. He just sucked so much. But yeah, so that's why Stanley sucks. I'm now going to get to the point of this video, which is to say why the documentary sucks. And the reason the documentary sucks is it's not really a documentary. It's a puff piece about Stan Lee. Everything in this completely ignores all controversies, the controversy he had between him and Ditko, between him and Jack Kirby, in all situations, it glosses over it, makes it pretty, makes him the good guy. It completely ignores the controversy between him and Marvel when he sued Marvel and they fought back and forth. Another reason the documentary sucks is that there are obvious and blatant contradictions through quotes by him, but they still put it out there like we're not going to notice. Stan Lee claims coming up with the idea to make a teenage superhero for the first time the 1960s with Spider-Man claiming that that never was done before, that teenagers were always the sidekicks, never the hero, yet Human Torch has existed for a while now. He also boasts about making a female character that has superpowers, not just some damsel in distress in The Invisible Girl, despite also just admitting that he based the Fantastic Four or was tasked to make the T Fantastic Four because DC Comics had just made the Justice League, which very notably has Wonder Woman in it. He also in the documentary talks about, I had not read any other hero that wished he could quit being a hero, despite already previously saying that about the Human Torch, saying that he was a character who was a superhero that didn't want to be one. You could also argue that the Thing was in the same boat where he didn't want to be a hero, he just kind of had to be. And once again, in the documentary, they use this quote by him where he's talking about how doing crossovers in comic books was this great new idea, when once again, the Justice League had been around for a long time, which took characters from different comic books and put them together. Batman, Superman, right there! Two different characters from two different comic books being put into a series of comics together. That is a crossover. He didn't come up with that concept. It's just absolutely insane that there's so many contradictions, wildly false claims, and sugarcoating that all went into this documentary, and it's like they don't even notice. They're just saying this bullshit, uh, parroting this bullshit from him, and just going, well, it's all obviously true. It's Stan the man. We love Stan, and it's... It's terrible. It's an awful, one-sided, biased, terrible documentary that doesn't even attempt to get into the nitty-gritty of anything. It's just very clearly on one side, doesn't care about any opposing voices or opinions at all, just wants you to feed into the frenzy that is Stanley worship. So to sum it up, yeah, Stanley was the chief editor, head writer, and publisher at Marvel Comics for a long time time and he was able to essentially do whatever he wanted and if people didn't like it then they could leave and so they did constantly and like i said after the notable writers left he didn't seem to have so much creative ability anymore for some reason so yeah stan lee was very clearly stealing from these artists claiming credit for the ideas that they fleshed out and created at least mostly if not entirely on their own he was a man who claimed to care most about the product when he clearly cared most about himself and his own image going from a supposed writer to celebrity doing interviews guest appearances cameos in his movies he very clearly cared more about that and the money, the image and the gold than actually creating characters that people would love and care about and relate to. Despite all of his claims opposing that, that is clearly what he was doing. Stan Lee was a fraud, a hack, and a thief that somehow convinced everybody that he was the golden child of comic books who could do no wrong. 
Fuck Stan Lee. Yes, I know he's dead. I think it's been long enough now. By the way, like I said, I didn't say shit about him when he died. I said it before he died, and then you guys got mad after telling me, you should show some respect. Okay, well, I think it's been enough time. It's been a few years, so I'm gonna say it. The guy sucked. He was terrible. And if you're basing your whole identity on some guy you've never met who was stealing work from other people, Maybe you should reevaluate yourself. Stanley sucked. I hate that guy, and I hate this documentary. It made me sick to my stomach. I couldn't watch it in one sitting. I had to break it up over three days because I just kept rage quitting it because of all the lies and misinformation in it. It's such a propaganda puff piece. So yeah, fuck that. Fuck Disney. Fuck Stanley. I'm done. <laughs> Feel free to comment your death threats. Like I said, it reflects more on you than it does on me. So say whatever you say. I've heard it all. Also, if you're still around this long, I muted Stan Lee in my comments a long time ago. So refer to him as he who must not be named. And I'll know who you're talking about. Because if you say Stan Lee in your comment, it's not going to get through. Sorry. Anyway, I'm Simon from Simon's Rants. And that was my rant for today. I always felt, you know, how could a grown man be doing comic books?